let me take an opportunity again to welcome you to First Baptist Mansfield. If you are our guest, we are especially glad that you're here today. If you are our guest, we do have uh, QR codes all throughout the building that would give you an opportunity to scan a welcome card and fill that out. We'd love to have a record of your visit so we can follow up and answer any questions you might have. If you're on campus, also know that out these doors to my right is our next step corner. And if you're our guest, we actually have a gift for you today. We'd love to connect with you, give you that gift, and just get to know you and minister to you in that way. Let me also say that today is Launch Sunday. Today is our monthly launch update where we're encouraging us as a body on the launch journey and inviting those of you that are new to join us on that journey. Launch is a two-year generosity initiative uh, designed to ignite a new season of ministry in us and through us as a body. Launch has been about really understanding what God's Word has to say about generosity and biblical stewardship as it relates to our finances. And what we learned is that we are not owners, but instead managers. Excellent job. We are managers who give our first and our best to our local church and in so doing transform temporal resources to make an eternal impact. The primary goal of launch was to see every single member, 100% of our body, engage their minds, their hearts, and their hands with what God's Word has to say. And I'm so incredibly blessed as your pastor to see so many of you doing that. We have seen such an incredible outpouring of generosity and sacrificial giving this first four months of launch that we've taken in already almost $1.2 million. Can we celebrate that together as a church family? Thank you, church family, for your generosity, for your willingness to give. The secondary goal of launch, though, was to make a kingdom impact through those resources. And we laid out several goals. The central among these was making an indispensable impact on the Mansfield region. It was our heart and desire to really engage this community in a fresh new way. Part of that was addressing some of the needs we had on our campus. We are uh, beginning the remodel of our auditorium. Uh, in fact, we have a quick picture here of some demolition that's been happening. Some of you want to stand up and rejoice that the demolition has begun. Let's celebrate that, what God is doing through that process. Uh, I know many of you are ready to get back into that room. We are too. We are looking at this fall being back in our worship center. So continue to pray about that. But we really also wanted to engage the community in a fresh way. And one of the ways that we did that was through community partnerships like the Metroplex Women's Clinic. And I'm going to show you a quick picture of a sonogram machine that we purchased, you purchased through your giving. Can we celebrate that church family? Almost a $30,000 sonogram that you bought that's literally in the life-saving business. So thank you, thank you so much as a church for being a part of that. But I want to go back to the primary goal just for a second because we really want these monthly launch updates to encourage and inspire you. And I want you to hear a story of a family that took very seriously what God was doing in and through them and launched it. I want you to listen to how God prompted them to make a very, very bold decision with their resources. Let's watch this. My name is uh, Jeremy Rudd, and this is my wife, Julie. And uh, we have been members at First Baptist for almost 14 years. Uh, we have three boys, Keller, who is a senior this year, Creston is 16, and Quinn is 14. We grew up in the church, and so we knew we've got to find a church. That was our first priority because we knew that was going to be our family. So this is our home, our community. So we serve in preschool, which I dearly love. One of my favorite hours of the week is being in preschool. Uh, we also lead a life group on Wednesday evenings um, of parents who have students who are here on Wednesday evenings. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been doing that for a couple of years, and, um, and I serve on the Pastor Advisory Council. We both um, grew up in Christian homes and, and were both taught by our parents um, the importance of tithing and giving back, um, knowing that, you know, out of obedience, because that's scriptural, um, also uh, the blessing that we receive uh, from giving back. So that was kind of something that we've always done from the time that we got married. We made a decision together to do that. And we've seen God bless through that. But mm -hmm. what was really cool was through launch, God really taught us that it wasn't just about giving 10%, um, that really everything we have, not only our finances, but our possessions, our talents, our time, um, everything is His, and we're just managers of that. God really began to speak to us and show us kind of what that looks like, that next step of not just tithing a 10%, but you know, just trusting God with everything. It was about two years ago, a little over two years ago, 
um, we started the process of building what we thought would be our dream home. We found some land uh, near Waxahachie and we began that process. And two years ago, a little over two years ago, we moved in. Through launch, God, I think God really started showing us, although that was great and that was nice, um, we really needed to be in Mansfield. Not just because, because we needed to give back or we needed to move or anything like that, but because this is our community and this is our church. We, hadn't, we never had any intentions of leaving First Mansfield. Something that we never thought would happen, we needed to move back. So that's, that's kind of where we are today, is in the process of, of moving back to Mansfield. We did grow up tithing, and so we, since we've always tithed, I thought God had nothing more to say to us about money because we were already doing what we were supposed to do. And I never asked for we should we be giving more. I just, I just thought you're supposed to tithe 10% at the end. Through the launch series, it really challenged me to talk to God about that and, and always have that out on the table. What do you want to not just do with our money, how much do you want me to give, um, but like our time, how and where do you want us to be serving? That was the first challenge that came to us was maybe what we're giving is not what we should be giving. God, in fact, did ask us to give more and we committed to do that. So one of my favorite authors is Corey Ten Boom and um, she said something that has always stuck with me. You should hold your things, your possessions really loosely and then it will not be painful if God needs to take those away. I didn't really think about that whenever we built our dream house because I thought, well, God is leading us to do this. He wants us to be here, so he won't take that away. It turns out he did, and he did ask us to leave, but the thing about it is, is that I don't feel about it like I thought I would. I'm not sad or angry or bitter or anything. Like I'm really walking away from this house with a smile, and I'm so happy for the people who are gonna move into this amazing house. We have no idea where we're going to be living. <laughs> we have no idea what the next step is, but I know that God's gonna provide. You're not going to outgive God. We we can give testimony to the fact that the more we have given, the more that we feel like we've gotten, um, not necessarily financially, but just um, He's blessed us through His His um, His presence and His um, comfort and peace and provision. It's real easy when you think about the things of this earth to, like Julie was saying, to hold on really tight. And and when you start looking at things with an eternal perspective we have an opportunity to invest in eternity and to be a part of something that God's doing. In my lifetime, this is the first time I've been a part of a church that is really seeking to live out what it tells us in Scripture, to be disciple makers. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that really excites me about the future of First Mansfield is I feel like we're doing what Christ called us to do. Well, can we thank the Reds for sharing with us? Great story about the journey they've been on. And so we are, I said again, mentioned a moment ago, doing these monthly launch updates to encourage those of you that are on the journey with us and to invite those of you that are new. If you have questions about that, there's a launch hub out there. We've got people ready to answer any questions you might have about how to get it connected to launch and what God is doing through that. But I also want to let you know that those of you that have made commitments, those of you that are on the launch journey, you are going to get a letter this week in the mail that's going to continue to update you about what's happening. One of the reasons we're doing this is because we as a church have been from the very beginning committed to transparency about how the resources you are entrusting to us are being spent and distributed. And so that's going to be there. It's also going to give you an update about your giving. That's meant to encourage you and help you on the journey as we are staying on this path to make an indispensable impact in the Mansfield region. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. If you have a copy of God's Word, please take it and turn with me to John 19. Over the next two weeks, we are going to focus our attention on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're going to be spending time thinking deeply about the cross. We're going to do this in two weeks. This latter part of chapter 19 breaks it into two weeks. And then on Easter Sunday, we will be looking again, as we've been discussing, at the resurrection account in John 20. If you've got John 19 open, would you please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word 
John 19. We're going to be looking at the second half of verse 16 all the way through 27. Then they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, one of our greatest joys as a church is getting to week after week gather around your word as a family and to hear from you. And Lord, you know that every week I feel inadequate to do that, but today, more than ever, as we think about your cross, I confess, we confess together our need for you to speak. God, would you let the heaviness and the weight of this passage settle in this room. Holy Spirit, would you take this word and bring it to life, pierce our hearts and our minds, drive it deep within us. Lord Jesus, as you speak, help us not just to hear what you say, but to do what you say. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. You can be seated. One of my tendencies is to fast forward through parts of movies I don't like. Especially if I've seen the movie before, I'll fast forward through the parts I don't like, the hero, his struggle, his problem, so I can get to the resolution, the victory, the good stuff. And Madison kind of alluded to this last week when he preached what I want more than anything for you today is for us not to fast forward through the cross. I want us as a church to sit and let the weight and the significance of the cross settle in our hearts and our minds. We've seen the context building to this point. We saw Jesus before the chief priest and John showed he's actually the true high priest. Jesus is the true priest. We saw Jesus before Pilate as Pilate interviewed him and we saw Jesus as the true king. We saw that Jesus was falsely accused, falsely condemned last week as Pilate multiple times tried to acquit him. And while John has established Jesus' kingship, his identity, the question is what kind of king is he going to be? What this passage does is it reveals the nature of the kingship of Jesus. It's true. Jesus has always been the son of God. Fully God, fully human. He is eternal in his nature. 
He is, he has been, he always will be. But there is a real sense in what we're observing in John 19 is Jesus becoming, Jesus fulfilling all that was promised about that son of David who would take away the sins of the world. And so what we're going to watch as we watch the cross is we're going to watch Jesus establish himself as the true king, the king of kings and lord of lords. The reason I want you to take this in today is because I believe when you truly understand Jesus as king, everything else in your life falls into place. When you understand the nature, the substance of what Jesus as kingship looks like and how he's established in that way, your eyes are opened to the truth. I want you to write this down first. I want you to notice in this passage that Jesus first is the crucified king. This passage shows us that Jesus is first the crucified king. It says, Then they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. The central idea here is crucifixion, and crucifixion was, if nothing else, an incredibly painful way to be executed. On the one hand, it involved incredible physical pain. Physical pain. You'll remember the context. Last week, Jesus had been scourged. He's been beaten. He's enduring severe blood loss, and in the midst of this blood loss and exhaustion, a large wooden beam is hoisted on his shoulders. As he carries this up to this hill outside of the city, a hill of execution called Golgotha, it would have been normal for him to be beaten as he went. When Jesus arrived at the crucifixion site, at the site of his execution, they would have taken his hands and pierced his hands with nails five to seven inches long, right through the most sensitive, some of the most sensitive nerves in your body. As he was spread out, his hands would have been nailed into that bar. And then they would have overlapped his feet on that vertical bar and driven one nail through both of them. He then would have been hoisted up and the cross would have slammed down into a prefabricated hole in the ground that they had designed for execution. This physical pain, though, not to be rivaled, did include emotional pain. Jesus was naked, stripped of his clothes, As we'll read about in a moment, his clothes are gambled away. But Jesus being naked wasn't just about making his execution more efficient. It was also about stripping him of his dignity. He was hung in a public place where people would walk by. It's not an exaggeration to say that thousands of people probably walked by Jesus as he hung naked on that cross. He was executed with criminals Real lawbreakers, rapists, murderers, thieves, rebels. Consistent with what Isaiah 53 predicted. Therefore I will give him the manyest portion. He will receive the mightiest spoil because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for those transgressors. The point of the cross was to display the might of Rome. It was to execute someone in such a shocking way that it sent a message. And that message was, don't mess with Rome or this could be you. But it wasn't just physical pain. It wasn't just emotional pain. It was also an extended pain. Somebody who was crucified could hang for hours, maybe even days in the hot sun. The way crucifixion was designed is in order to breathe, you had to push yourself up. You see, as your, your body hung on the cross, your weight of your body was hanging on your lungs and your diaphragm. You couldn't catch your breath. So to catch your breath, you had to pull yourself up. You had to push yourself up. And with every push up, it was a painful calculation. What will hurt more? Pushing myself up one more time or dying from a lack of oxygen. To die on the cross was to die in a way that was akin to drowning. Asphyxiation, losing oxygen. 
This extended pain was by design. Rome designed this to be an incredibly agonizing process that zaps somebody not just of their life, but of their dignity as a person. I read this past week that the Supreme Court in our country just ruled that it's a right to be protected, that if you're being executed in our country, you have to have a clergy or a pastor if you want that person there. There was a debate about that. And the Supreme Court said, no, you, you need to be able to have a pastor there if you want one when you're being executed in America. Americans as a culture think about how to make death dignified and quick. The Romans thought exactly the opposite. How can we make death undignified and as long and as agonizing as possible? The value for Rome was sadistic creativity. And what I want you to see in this is that the pain of Jesus, write this down if you're taking notes, the pain of Jesus is both excruciating and undeserving. The pain of Jesus that he experiences on the cross is excruciatingly difficult. The word excruciating literally means out of the cross. It's the worst kind of physical pain you can imagine. But we can't miss that the flow of John has made it clear. The thrust of the gospel of John has demonstrated that Jesus is an innocent man being crucified. Jesus is an innocent man we saw that last week. Pilate multiple times tries to get him off the hook, tries to have him acquitted. But because of spite from the Jews and political convenience of Pilate and by the sovereign design of God, Jesus is crucified. What we need to lean into as a body of believers is to confess that Jesus, the innocent one, died for the guilty. The innocent Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, died for guilty people. Let me tell you why that's so important. People do not understand that unless you tell them. Our confession as a church is that an innocent man, the innocent Son of God, died for the guilty. People do not understand that just by looking at your life. Just by seeing some inspirational quotes on social media. Just by having a loving relationship or a kind word for them at work, they only understand this if you open your mouth and say, the innocent Son of God died for guilty people. Church, let's be a church that holds up and lifts up the crucified King for who He truly is. But this passage doesn't just show that Jesus is the crucified King. Secondly, write this down. It shows Him to be the true King. The true king. We see in this passage Pilate's revenge. It was common practice for criminals that were crucified to have a sign either around their neck or above their heads that communicated what they had done to warrant crucifixion. Pilate uses this custom to jab at the Jews. Look at verse 19. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. See, Pilate knows that he's been manipulated. Pilate knows that the Jews are having Jesus killed out of spite, out of anger. And so he jabs at them with the sign to say, oh, you want a king? Here's the king of the Jews, the crucified king of the Jews. And he jabs at them to make matters worth, he has this sign put in a public place in three languages. Aramaic, the language of the Jews at the time. Greek, the common trade language of the empire. And Latin, the language of the Roman government and the Roman army. The Jews feel this. They feel the sting of Pilate's revenge as he's jabbing at them. In verse 21, look at what they say. The chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said... I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I've written, I've written. Feeling the sting of Pilate's jeering, they ask for its removal, but Pilate doubles down. Now what I want you to see is that this is another moment of John using irony in his gospel. 
There's an irony here that we don't need to miss. We've seen this in other points. For example, when one of the chief priests said, it's better for one man to die than for the nation. And John says, hey, this is, this is <laughs> they were saying something. They didn't realize how true it actually was. That same kind of irony is true here because God is declaring Jesus to be the true king. Jesus is a Jewish king. He's the son of David who would take away the sins of the world. He's the son of promise. He's the Messiah. Jesus is the global king. He's not come just to save the Jews. He's come to save a people from every tribe and tongue and language. And so these three full languages on the sign actually symbolically represent that global vision. Jesus is a humble king. He's not the king the chief priests want, but he's the king they need. But Jesus is also the true king. Pilate becomes almost a prophet. Because when they ask him to take the sign down, he doubles down with this perfect tense declaration. What I've written, I've written with ultimate authority. But what Pilate's really confessing is what God has declared. And this is what I want you to write down if you're taking notes. The true king is the crucified king. The true king of the universe is the crucified king hanging on this cross in this passage. See, what's needed is not a king who just waves a scepter giving decrees. What's needed is not a king who just teaches us how to live by providing wise sayings. The king we need is not a king who just fights or enacts revenge on his enemies. What we need, first and foremost, is a king who will die for us. The king we need is the one who will die in our place as our substitute. In the Old Testament, Abraham is given a child of promise named Isaac. And God comes to him and says, I want you to sacrifice this son. Filled with confusion, Abraham nevertheless obeys and he takes his son, the wood and the knife, up the hill. He lays his son on the altar and with knife in his hand, the angel of the Lord says, stop. Now it's your pastor's conviction and belief that that angel of the Lord is Jesus in the Old Testament. I believe Jesus is there communicating to Abraham. And what Abraham's attention is drawn to is a ram caught in a thicket. And if you remember the story, what happens is the ram is sacrificed in place of Isaac. What this passage is, is Jesus drawing our attention not to a thicket with a lamb, but to a cross. Jesus is saying the cross, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is dying in our place. In a declaration that's echoing through not just the scriptures and hundreds of pictures in the Old Testament, but throughout the ages, the cross is Jesus, the Lamb of God caught in the cross, the thicket of the cross for you and for me. We need the crucified King to take away our sin, but that doesn't mean that we won't deal with the effects of sin, but rather that the penalty and the power of sin are being destroyed in Christ. It has been a little over two weeks since my dad uh, passed away. And one of the great joys of our family's life is knowing that while my dad, he felt the effects of sin, but because he trusted Christ, he does not feel the ultimate consequence of sin. See, the hope of the gospel is not that you get a new car, that you get a new house, that you get stuff. That's not the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is that our ultimate penalty, the wrath and the justice of God in an everlasting hell, is dealt with in the cross. That's our hope. Jesus here is not winning for you and for me physical healing from every ailment. He's not winning a life of health, wealth, and prosperity. What he is winning is freedom and forgiveness from the wrath and the justice of God towards our sin. That's what we have in John 19. The reason this is so important is because Christ's solution reveals your problem and mine. If we need a crucified king, that means we have a problem that's beyond us, that's greater than us. 
If we need a crucified king, we have a problem that's beyond our power. I don't have the strength to deal with my sin. If we need a crucified king, we have a problem that's greater than our wisdom. I'm not smart enough or intelligent enough to work my way through my sin. If I need a crucified king, I have a problem that's greater than my connections and my network. I don't know enough people to get me out of the problem of my sin. If I need a crucified king, I have a problem that's bigger than my money. My sin cannot be solved by any amount of money I can pay somebody off with. If I need a crucified king, my sin is greater than my status. My position in my company, my job, my network of friends won't be solved, won't solve my sin. We need this crucified king to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's the beauty of the cross. What Jesus is doing for us here is he's doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, if you do not know him as your Savior, our appeal to you is to turn from your sin, to turn from thinking that you on yourself are enough, that your power, your strength, your money, your stuff is enough, to repent of those things and trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Let me make it as plain as I can. The message you and I get every single day is wrong. We are not enough. You don't have enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. But Christ is. And the glorious good news of the gospel is that even though we're not enough, Christ is enough for us. If you've never crossed the line of faith and become a follower of Jesus, we'd love to talk with you and pray with you. Help you understand more about what it means to be a follower. Out these doors to my right, as soon as the service is over, we're going to have a next step corner. We have pastors and leaders there. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you about what it means to become a Christian. Jesus Christ, the crucified king, is the true king. And while he's not the king we deserve, he is the king we need. This passage ends, though, with a third thing I want you to notice, and that is that Jesus is the gracious king. He's the crucified king. He's the true king. But as the camera pans down to the foot of the cross, we see his grace in a powerful way. The camera does move indeed to the foot of the cross as there are two scenes that we see unfold that show us God's incredible grace and mercy. The first scene is the soldiers. The four soldiers there are gambling for Jesus' possessions. It was normal for those soldiers that perpetrated an execution to part of their wage was receiving what the executed individual had in their possession, and so they're indeed doing that. But they come across this robe, this tunic, that's one singular piece, and so because they don't want to rip it into four parts, they gamble away for it. We don't know if they threw dice or drew straws, but they do something so that where one of them won it and the rest didn't get it. Indeed, this is a fulfillment of Psalm 22 and David's experience. We're going to talk a lot more about fulfillment next week. Come back to part two as we'll unpack Jesus' finished work on the cross. But here I want you to notice that this isn't the first time Jesus has laid aside his robe to serve. In John 13, what did Jesus do? He laid aside his robe, the Bible tells us. He put a towel around his waist and he got on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet. I believe part of what John wants us to see and emphasizing this idea of this tunic is he wants us to see that Jesus here is serving again. He's putting the needs of his people before himself. The cross that is meant to be seen not as an accident, not as a detour, not as some plan B, but as God's gracious design to serve his children. But the second scene that shows us the grace of Jesus is also Jesus' care for his mother. There are four soldiers around the cross and there are four women, the Bible tells us, one of which is indeed Mary, the mother of Jesus. The apostle John is also there and Jesus, seeing this in verse 26, says this, look at it with me. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, he left standing there. He said to his mother, woman, where, uh, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. 
Now, on the one hand, this is an incredible moment of grace and kindness on the part of Jesus. Here he is in his most desperate, dire moment of his life, literally bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders, and he looks and cares for his family. He has John agree to take his mother into his care and into his home. Remember what it took for Jesus to say something. To just to get a breath, he had to push himself up. Can you imagine what he exerted to push himself up and say these words to his mother and to John? It's an incredible act of grace, showing us the posture of Jesus to care for and serve his people. But there's something else I want you to see in this moment. I believe God is also showing us that his new family, the new people of God that is the church, will not be defined by blood or genetics, but by the cross. Jesus in this moment is foreshadowing, is giving us a picture of the fact that the new people of God, the church, will not be defined by their ethnicity or some kind of blood or genetic connection, but rather by his blood, by his grace, by his finished work. This is foreshadowing the church, the body of Christ, that we're united to Jesus and to one another by this supernatural connection that makes us on the one hand an embassy of heaven, that we're an appetizer, a foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. The church and how it loves one another, forgives one another, serves one another, teaches one another is meant to be this foreshadow, this picture, this appetizer of heaven. But the church is, on the other hand, the advanced team for the return of Christ. The church is tasked with communicating clearly and boldly the gospel to a waiting and watching world as Jesus returns. Both this embassy idea and this advanced team idea are wrapped up in Christ's work in us. He defines, he shapes us as his new people. Write this down if you're taking notes. The gracious king creates a gracious people. What Jesus is doing from the cross is foreshadowing this gracious people that will be defined by his love and mercy and his cross. It's critical, church, to remember that the cross defines and establishes not just my relationship vertically with God, but it also establishes my relationships horizontally with other people. There was a point in Jesus' ministry where some people come to him and say, hey, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Jesus says, you remember what he says? 70 times 7. So what do they do? They get out their calculator. They start writing it down. It doesn't make sense. That's a weird number. And Jesus says, okay, you're not getting it. Let me tell you a story. He tells them a story of a servant who's forgiven an incredible debt, massive debt by his master, only to turn around and go and be unwilling to forgive a much smaller debt of one of his fellow servants. And Jesus says, essentially, his forgiveness to us is meant to shape our forgiveness of others. Especially in your church, the way God has treated you is to shape the way you treat other people. One of the primary things that makes the church a foretaste of heaven, an embassy of the kingdom, is through this kind of gospel-shaped community. We're loving and serving and speaking truth into each other because the gospel frees us to do that. The gospel frees me to confess my sin to you, for you to confess your sin to me. Why? Because in Christ, I don't have to live in the shadows with my sin. I can step into the light, not celebrating or magnifying my sin, but confessing and holding up my brokenness and asking for people to minister to me. What's meant to define our church as a kind of gospel-shaped community that allows me to say to other people, neither do I condemn you, John 8, neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more. How can I forgive you? people? How can I call them to holiness like that? It's because that's the way Jesus treats me. This is important not just for our church family. It's also important for our families and our homes. Parents, one of the most important things we should be doing with our kids, we need to be doing with our kids, is not just teaching them the gospel, but making sure the gospel shows up when we sin against one another. I don't know about you, but there's not a week, a day, Maybe an hour that goes by when somebody didn't sin in our house. What do you do when sin shows up? You yell. 
You get frustrated. You ignore. You hand them a screen and just act like everything is great and move on with your life. Or do you recognize that as an ambassador of Jesus in the life of your child, you've been given an opportunity to not just tell them the gospel, but show them the gospel? What does that look like? Think John 8. When somebody sins in our house, we call them to account, they repent. And what do we say to them? Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Now, the order to that is critical. Because if you get it reversed, here's what happens. Go and sin no more, and then I'll love you. Do the right thing, and then you'll have my approval. Can I tell you what our children need from us? They need the same kind of acceptance and love we have in Christ in their lives from us. I'm not saying that we're soft on sin, that we don't deal with disobedience in our homes, but that the love Jesus has given us that we show them becomes the resources that we need to address holiness. If I don't have the security and love in Christ in my relationships with other people, it's hard for me to really strive for holiness and righteousness. Parents, this cross, this moment means that our relationships as believers is meant to, are meant to be defined by the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ and his crucified work accomplishes not just restoration vertically in our standing with God. He also establishes restoration horizontally in our relationships with one another. The true king is the crucified king. My prayer today is that you've been given an opportunity to really reflect on that, to feel the weight of that. To help drive that home, we're going to have a time of response. I'm going to ask our musicians and band to come on back up. We're going to sing an old song that some of you may not be familiar with, but it's called, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. It's got some old words in it. It's okay. We believe the Holy Spirit's been working and moving in the church for thousands of years, and we sing this song. We hear the song sung this morning as we reflect on the glory and the beauty of what Jesus has done for us. My prayer for you and for me as we hear this song sung over us and in us is that we'll let the cross of Christ speak with new and fresh power and grace and clarity in our hearts. As we prepare our hearts to hear this song, would you please bow your heads, close your eyes, as I read some of the verses from Isaiah 53 to prepare our hearts. Listen to these words that were written in the Old Testament, prophesying, declaring, predicting, clarifying of Jesus. says, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, this is speaking of Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he didn't have any impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men man of sorrows who knew what sickness was he was like someone people turned away from he was despised and we didn't value him yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains we in turn regarded him stricken struck down by God and afflicted he was pierced because of our rebellion crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth taken away because of oppression and judgment and who considered his fate for he was cut off from the land of the living he was struck because of my people's rebellion Heavenly Father we thank you that today I do believe your spirit
has allowed us to feel the weight and the heaviness of the cross. God, I pray for believers in this room who've known Jesus for some time. I pray that this passage, this message today has renewed their hearts, has restored, Lord, some sensitivity in them in us to the weight and the significance of the cross. But finally, Lord, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open the eyes of the lost. God, show them not just the emptiness of their sin. Yes, show them that. Show them the self-sufficiency and worship of self and living your life for yourself. And Lord, would you turn their eyes and their hearts to see the beauty of Jesus? God, would you save them from their sin and set their feet on the rock? Jesus, we thank you that through your cross, you were wounded on our behalf. reflect on this together.
pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that in Jesus' name, we have this incredible forgiveness and grace. Thank you, Jesus, that because you are our sacred head that's been wounded, you have secured for us everlasting life. I pray, Lord, that as we leave here in a moment, God, you've refreshed our souls. You've given us true peace and assurance that comes from knowing you. Jesus, we thank you and exalt your glorious grace in our lives. It's in your strong name we pray all these things. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to end our service this morning uh, by celebrating baptism and by remembering uh, the incredible gift that's been given to us in Jesus and by celebrating some that are coming today to say that this head that was wounded for them who took their place is their Savior. Anytime we enter these waters of baptism, I think it's really important to remember what baptism is. Baptism is, on the one hand, a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's symbolizing the death of Jesus as we go under the water and the resurrection of Christ as we come up. It's also important to note that the folks that are entering this water in a moment have already come to Christ. They already have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We do not believe this uh, water saves them. It is nevertheless a picture and a profession, secondly, of their faith. It's the way they're declaring to the world that Christ has saved them from their sin. But finally, baptism is also thirdly a plea. It's an invitation to help and accountability in church. This is why we believe baptism is something for the church because we want this to be an opportunity for you to join with these families, join with these ones who are coming to say they are following Jesus and they want your help. So we have two coming today. We had one in the first service. I feel like we should celebrate the one in the first service. Can we clap and thank God for mercy in the first service? Let me go ahead and have Emerson come on up. This is sweet Emerson. Okay, why don't you just stand right here, sweetie, just like this. Can you face everybody? This is Emerson Farmer, and Emerson has some family and friends who are here today. If you are a family member or a friend, would you please stand as you support her today? Can we celebrate? All right, you can be seated. Incredible blessing today to celebrate with Emerson and her family. A few weeks ago, after having a season of talking a lot about the gospel and Talking with leaders in our church, we really believe that Emerson has come to place her faith and her trust in Jesus. Can we celebrate what God has done in Emerson's life? All right, sweetie, just turn this way. Let me ask you a couple questions. Is it true that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? Yes. And do you want to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Great. Let me move up here. Well, based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, here we go. Okay. All right, we have one more baptism today. I'm going to let Parker Silly, our student minister, introduce and baptize our next candidate here. Well, let me introduce you to Janessa. Uh, if you're a family or friend of Janessa, would you please stand just so we could recognize you right now? Uh, so Janessa, she grew up uh, pretty much all, always hearing about the things of God, hearing about the person of Christ. Uh, she was raised up to be a soldier for the Salvation Army. Um, but it wasn't until about her freshman year whenever she really started to take a personal ownership over her faith. Um, and really individually submit herself to Christ. And so she's here today to profess that through baptism. Um, baptism is actually really special because it's a symbol of adoption. Uh, it's how we at the church recognize and welcome her.
Well, every Sunday is a good Sunday, right? But today's a really good Sunday. So thank you guys for coming today. Again, if you're a guest and we've not had a chance to meet you, we would love to do that before we leave at our next step corner. Others, let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the incredible privilege and just grace of getting to gather together and hear your word preached and proclaimed, to sing, to celebrate baptism, and to hear stories of how you're moving in our family's lives. I pray that as we leave here now, we would remember that the true king is the crucified king and that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Thank you.